When you're tired of London, you're tired of life. So the saying goes... Now, as Europe correspondent for the last few years, I've watched as the clock ticks down, hurtling towards a huge moment, even for this grand city. Make way for the London Olympics 2012. It's going to be a hell of a show, at least that's what we're promised. And I'd have to say there is a palpable sense of excitement here. Most people want Britain to succeed on the world stage, but scratch that shiny Olympic surface and not everyone's happy. Either way, love it or loathe it, the greatest show on earth is coming, ready or not. In our whirlwind tour of this city, I'll meet a famous Londoner who's invested everything in the games and can already smell success in his nostrils. Fantastic. And a less well-known chap with a different take on what's happening to his city. Crack comes to mind. <laughs> there are plenty of grumpy old men around here. We'll meet an elite Olympic gold grump. Because frankly, I think that, that kind of sport's bullshit anyway. And someone else who can't believe their luck. Wow, that is absolutely stunning. That is amazing. It's tough, isn't it? We've arrived at the field of Olympic dreams, eight kilometres northeast of Big Ben as the crow flies. 200 hectares carved out of what Game Spruik has described as a toxic wasteland in London's hugely unfashionable and unloved East End. Rising Phoenix-like from the marshlands, the 80,000 seat stadium, on this day hosting university games. It's a trial run for the real thing when more than 10,000 of the world's finest athletes test their metal and compete for metal that they hope will be gold. Look straight down at me. I'm sorry. Start with you. That's good. Changing the crop. Okay. Slightly happier for a couple. That's it. Seven years in the making, no one has invested more time and energy in these games than this man. Arguably the world's greatest middle distance runner in the 1980s, he's still running things. I'm done, thank you very much. <coughs> We're about to meet Mr. Olympics himself, Seb Coe, Lord Seb Coe. Of course, uh, he's won gold medals for GB before. He's really the, the Lord of this ring here. Uh, because without him, it probably wouldn't have happened. Oxford versus Cambridge, watch out! Thank you. It's all right. <laughs> Lord Coe is a man in demand and a man with a story to tell. All good, of course. Well, it, it's an extraordinary story. You know, if you'd been here eight years ago and we were standing on a poison parcel of land that really was, was you know, had been neglected for over 60 years, we're now standing in a world-class sporting venue that will go on serving communities for years to come. You're standing on the site eight years ago, a 50 foot mountain of rotting fridges. What's it mean for the country? What, what does Britain get out of this? Britain gets out of it exactly what Australia did. You know, no country is ever the same once it's staged a game, certainly no city is ever the same. But I had to step outside of the arena to uncover some of the other stories. Hackney is one of the five London boroughs that borders the Olympic Park. Culturally diverse, a mixture of the middle class and the poor. It's something else, it's something new requiring gills and built-in decontamination filters. And home for 40 years to author and Olympic skeptic Ian Sinclair a man with a mission to expose what he says are the lies and deceptions of an Olympic nightmare. 
gateway to London's Olympic Park, over 300 dynamic brands, 1.9 million square feet of retail and leisure destination, Westfield. I was intrigued by this Australian connection, so I collared Ian Sinclair to ask what it was all about. Hi, yeah, Philip Williams oh, from hi, ABC. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Yes. Can you take me there? Yeah, I can take Is you there. Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. Great. We'll probably get a nice London day to do it. It turns out that by happy coincidence, the recently opened Westfield Stratford shopping mall finds itself right on the front door of the Olympics. To get to the Games, most visitors will be funnelled from the train station right through the middle of one of Europe's largest shopping centres. What we've got here is the Olympic Way, otherwise known as a track through the chasm of retail opportunities that is the Westfield Super Mall. So the Olympic experience is also going to be a Westfield experience? I think we could put it the other way around. The Westfield experience has a possibility of a minor Olympic extension for a couple of weeks. And yet thousands of people are going in there every day. Yeah, thousands of people used to turn up to public hangings. They were very, very popular, but civilization does move on. I suspect if hanging was still an option, Ian Sinclair may have ended up swinging for his Olympic cynicism. He took me further around the alarmed and razor wire Olympic perimeter. It's as close as many Londoners will get to the Games. We're now going to have more military personnel at Stratford um, around the Westfield Mall and the Olympic site than we used in the whole of the Afghanistan campaign from England. Really? That's a fact. How do you feel as a local resident when you see this? Well, I feel, I feel excluded from my own territory. I feel I hardly know who I am myself because all my familiar markers that I've known over 40 years have either disappeared or been enclosed in razor wire. In one respect, we are the world leaders, and that is in fences and surveillance systems, CCTV cameras, helicopters overhead, all of that. We, we're pretty safe, we're secure. Everybody knows what we're doing all of the time. Gold medal. Gold medal, definitely. Ian Sinclair's magical misery tour was getting a bit of a downer after Lord Coe's glowing spruik. But this man of intellect and culture surely knows art when he sees it. Well, but this particular piece, I think, is like a DNA spiral caught in a whirlwind and blown round an East German border post. Spearing higher than the Statue of Liberty on the Olympic site is his sculpture by British artist Anish Kapoor. It'll be there long after the Games as a viewing platform over London. If the stadium itself is a flat pack stadium from Ikea that could be any height you want, these are the bits that are left over. There's always something at the bottom of the bag that you can't fit and they've scrambled it together. It's turning the city into a circus like the end of the Roman Empire. It's all blood and circuses. Take the minds of the people off it by throwing up another big show. And this is the biggest show in the world. The greatest show on earth straddles a vast area. It stomps on a lot more ground than the rusting pile of refrigerators Lord Coe talks about. Philip Williams, oh, foreign correspondent. Yep. Nice to meet you. Yep. Julian Chain was one of the 430 residents in his Great estate tapped on the place. shoulder and told to move on in advance of the bulldozers. Clayland's estate was a social experiment in the 1970s, the UK's largest purpose-built housing co-op. The residents received a small relocation allowance, small comfort for the upheaval to their lives. Well, I've lost a home. I had a bungalow, which um, I wanted to continue living in. And I lost a community, which was a lot of people living nearby. The estate was laid out in a series of 10 courtyards. Um, and it was a very sociable place. And there were lots of people that I knew there. So as far as I was concerned, you know, this was, um, this was my home really for the rest of my life. When you look out here, look around, what do you see? I'm afraid I'm depressed because I, I see something which is, is basically a lie. This was a working industrial area and working industrial areas are not always pretty, but there were perfectly nice factories and workshops 
It was not a, uh, the whole place was not some kind of waste tip. If you want to have a national celebration, a national sports celebration, you can do that by employing existing facilities. You don't have to go for this massive kind of spaceship kind of thing landing in the middle of East London like this. After the shock and shame of the London riots, this city needed an upbeat ambassador, someone who could instill a little optimism into angry youth, and a man Olympic sponsors could call their own. You right? Well, they found him, one of the UK's hottest rap stars, Rich 32. And you're up next, let's take it away. I'm at London's other big venue, the Millennium Stadium, lost and confused in the backstage labyrinth. Well, we're going to meet Rich32. He's a, a big star, and we're on the run. Apparently, very keen on the Olympics. Let's see what happens. A wrong turn and an accidental stage appearance. But clearly not a letdown for the fans. After my 15 seconds of fraudulent fame, I found the real star out the back. It's an incredible uh, venue here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never been out here. If celebrity is measured by the size of his bus, Rich 32 is as big as they come, and an Olympic ambassador to boot. I think the Olympics will definitely help lift the moods of, of, of a lot of people, of, of the country as well, in general. I think when everyone sat at home watching, you know, their, their, their favourite sport, they're watching the Olympics and they know that this is only taking place around the corner or everybody's in the venue and they're watching it go down. I think everybody's spirit is going to be lifted, man, and I think that's a, it's a real good vibe, man. It's, it's exciting. Some people are a bit down on it. They're saying that we're not getting the jobs we thought we'd get or we're losing our sporting fields and that sort of thing, especially in the Hackney area. Yeah. What, what would you say to that? Um, do you know what? The weird thing about that is I'm not, I'm not too much of a politician, man. I just kind of go with the flow. I, wouldn't, I don't let anything like that hinder my mood or, or get me down. So if, if it's, you just got to look at the plus side to everything, I suppose. So if you're... If you're from that area and it's coming to your town, just make sure you go and watch it, to be honest. I think everything else will be all right. Can I just quickly get a snap? I'm buoyed by Wretch's prediction that the Olympics will be banging, haps and fully sick. That is a jolly good show. But I suspect the man I'm running late to see won't be so upbeat. He's not someone I want to keep waiting, with his reputation as one of British television's grumpy old men. Uh, where, where's my coffee? <laughs> Will. Philip Williams. How, How are you? you? Nice to meet Sorry. you. So, the Olympics, not a big fan. The fact that somebody can run or jump faster or, you know, higher than somebody else, that's not a meaningful essay of a, of a country's worth. It feels like North Korea to me, actually. When people go, yay, the Olympics, the Olympic bid, yay, it's like Kim Il-jung, you know, we don't really know why we're cheering for the great leader and his amazing plan, but we better do it because, hey, you know, that's what people like us do. If you talk to people in a reasoned way, then you very quickly get the picture that, that, that it means virtually nothing to them. It's not impacting on you know, people's lives here at the moment. It's not what they need. What's for you as a single most then offensive element of this whole project? Of the Olympics? It's the nationalism, uh, actually. It's, I find that the most offensive. It's the, it's the yoking, you know, so it's the Jubilee year, and it's the Olympics year, and it's rah, rah, rah for the Queenie, and rah, rah, rah for our sporty folk. And that to me is, again, it's insulting. You know, it's insulting to people's intelligence that they should be demanded to pay attention to a higher ideal that is so empty and worthless. And yet millions mm. will be there, they'll be enjoying it, they'll be watching it on television, they may even feel a sense of national pride about the whole show. 
it's all over in a couple of weeks of flim flam and then we're left with this cracked and spalling piles of concrete. When they talk about the legacy though, that this is going to leave mm. fabulous facilities mm. that will encourage people to play sport for decades to come. You know, what encourages people to play sport is getting off their asses from in front of the TV and getting down the local playing field and doing it. And the spectacle of elite athletes, I never really buy that. Because frankly, I think that, that kind of sport's bullshit anyway. Hey, move it! Move it! Move it! Hey, come on! When move Brits it! think of sport, for most, this is the game of choice. The Olympic goal is to get an extra million bucks off the couch and into places like this. This is the local Hackney Marshes Sunday morning football. It's spitting distance from the Olympic site, a bit too close. Look how much time he's got! And again, and again, and again, he's working back! Working back, working back, working back! It's elitist. Everything seems to be played towards the elitist, and the grassroots is neglected. Oh, you ain't going to get your elitists if you don't look after the grassroots. Johnny Walker has had local footy running through his veins for most of his 78 years. He's the undisputed boss of the 1,500 players of the Hackney and Leighton League, but he was powerless to stop Olympic authorities paving over 12 of his beloved grounds for what they say is a temporary car park. <laughs> it represents a glorious land grab to me. That, that's all it seems to be about. You know, the, they've taken so much land round here. Let's look at one word to encapsulate the Olympics for you. What would that one word be? Nightmare, to be honest. It's up there with a whole range of other disgusting words that I can think of and can't repeat. So uh, that's basically what I think. Have a go. You're on Australian television. <laughs> well, uh, well, I can't go too strong. <laughs> but, uh, crap comes to mind. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I hate the bloody word, and I hate the people that pontificate in, in front of it. If Lord Coe was here, what would you tell him? What would I tell him? It, it, if I was younger, I'd like to give him a clamp. Because these smug look, you know, and uh, oh, well, you know, I've done all this, I've done all that. Yeah, he's done it on the backs of us. Well, I like a chin him. <laughs> For Lord Coe and his cohorts, the grand vision of a great games shouldn't be clouded by the loss of a few local footy fields. But what the Olympics takes, the Olympics can sure give back, and then some. Wow, that is absolutely stunning. That is amazing. It's up, isn't it? I'm very proud of it, I must say. Wow, and how much of a role has the Olympics played in their construction and in, in this being here? Well, they contributed 1.2 million towards the cost of, total cost of the building, so yes, we wouldn't have been here without them. Could you show me around? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. In London's southeast, former Olympian Yvonne Arnold runs a gym big enough to keep the whole community fit. Soon it'll become a training venue for Olympic volleyball teams. She's also nurturing the next generation of champions. Can you see some gold medalists here, perhaps? I hope so. I think we have got a two or three that could make it to Rio. Yes, we're too young now for, for London. We haven't got anybody for London, but um, Rio definitely four years down the line. I see maybe two or three. Carolina? Carolina? This is a facility that will be here for a long time after the Olympic torch moves on. It's the games giving something back. The husband and wife team who once struggled to maintain their gym in a dilapidated warehouse have now struck gold well before the games. And the whole community is sharing their good fortune. This will be a play space for 1,300 local children and their 30 coaches and supervisors. I never thought, I never dreamed that I would have a building of, of this size, this magnitude with all this wonderful equipment. I never dreamed, when I think back to our old place, um, we really struggled there, really, really struggled. And now, well, hopefully, sky's the limit. It's quite an emotional thing for you, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is emotional, yeah. It does make me emotional as well. And I, whenever I walk through those doors and show people the gym, I have an, a well of pride inside me. And um, yeah, you're right, I can't stop smiling about it. <laughs> Thank you.
Back at Centre Stage Olympic Park, the trials inside the 80,000 seat main stadium are giving up and coming British athletes a moment to experience the biggest stage of all. But getting ordinary Brits off their backsides is a core pledge of the Olympic promoters. It was their way of selling the games to the wider public, and ever wider the public is becoming. One in four adults in Britain is now classified as obese, so you can imagine the scepticism at claims that millions more would take up sport and exercise, all inspired by the 30th Olympiad. I don't believe sport for all has ever put one extra person into sport. I actually believe the inspiration from sport comes from big British moments, Australian moments, and they tend to be in Olympic Games. But perhaps hedging their bets alongside the main stadium and swimming centre is this, the world's largest McDonald's. It's here to provide local jobs, of course. Planners claim by the time the Olympic Park is complete, 40,000 people will have worked at this site. It's all about change for a greater good and legacy, legacy, legacy. So don't worry Londoners, it might all seem a bit chaotic, but look at what you'll be left with. The government ringmaster for all of this is the Olympics minister. Hugh Robertson has got to get it right, no pressure. Well, I often say, I mean, in a sense, with almost everything we do with the London Olympics, we use Sydney as a benchmark. I suspect this is going to be one of those moments of great national celebration. People will benchmark their lives by where they were in 2012. You talk to any Australian who's interested in sport and they pretty quickly go back to Sydney 2000. And I'm sure it's going to have a very similar effect here. If you're wrong, you might be looking for a new job. Uh, if I'm wrong, I will be looking for a new job, <laughs> uh, but I don't anticipate that. One of the great rivalries, of course, is who gets the most medals, oh, Australia right. GB. Yeah. And it's been seesawing yeah. lately. What's your bet? My bet is that British sport is in a very strong position at the moment. Indeed, I have a, a bet with my Australian counterpart over who's going to win the more gold medals in, in the table. Can I have a tenner on that? Yes. Can we shake on that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll be back to collect. <laughs> right, okay. I've, uh, the, the thing, um, I, actually, the, the, um, if I lose this bet, uh, I've got to run round Australia House in an Australia hockey singlet. So there you go. We'll be there. We'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As I watch the clock run down and this city preening itself, I wonder whether London will be left in better shape and maybe even turn old sceptics around. Hmm, maybe not. There is an aesthetic to it. People really appreciate that aesthetic of ultimate speed and fitness. I believe a guy called Hitler really appreciated that too. Given your effort and, and given your concentration on this whole Olympic phenomena, do you get annoyed when you hear people criticising? No, it goes with the territory. I've got great friends that put the Sydney project together. I think we've actually had a far, a far uh, gentler ride than some of the misconceptions that were being peddled in, in Australian media before the Games. You know, if you remember, on the eve of the Games, it was going to be a national disaster. It turned out to be the greatest Games ever. If you had one word to describe the Olympics, what would it be? Fantastic. So there you are. I hope he's right. There's a lot of money on it, and not just my tenor. These are hard times, and Lord knows the country could certainly do with a lift. <laughs>